This is Trepwire, Week in Review for the week ending September 29, 2023. I'm Haley Keen with Trep, a data, modeling, and analytics firm for the CMBS, commercial real estate, and CLO markets. I'm with Manish Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Lonnie Hendry, Head of CRE and Advisory Services. It was another rough week for investors across the board. Rising treasury yields and oil prices dragged stocks sharply lower this week as the yield on the 10-year treasury hit a 15-year high. In addition, economic data came in cooler than expected. On Tuesday, new home sales and the conference board's consumer confidence number both came in below expectations. On Thursday, pending home sales came in well below estimates as high mortgage rates clobbered demand. And did we mention that JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon believes a 7% Fed funds rate is not out of the question? Manis, it seems like there was nowhere for investors to hide this week. I think that was spot on. I think the only happy investors this week were those that plowed into three month and six month and one year treasuries and sat on their cash with nice five and a half percent yields. It was a very tough week. Treasury yields rose consistently across the board. At one point today, the 10 year was up about six or seven basis points again to 4.70%. And I think that has people rattled. I think that certainly it weighed on tech valuations this week as tech took the brunt of it uh, in the stock market losses. And I think that there was no end in sight. We did see a reprieve in the second half of Thursday's trading. We did get a relief rally and treasury yields did finally fall. It felt like a fever breaking, right? That it's like when you have an infant child and the fever just keeps going up and up and up. And, and finally you get that relief when the temperature drops a couple of degrees. That's what it felt like today with the, with the treasury yields. So I think across the board, everybody's concerned. Oil uh, could soon be above $100 a barrel. That's problematic. We do see the cost of mortgages now above 7.5%. That's worrisome for the housing market. Lonnie will probably talk about that a little bit in a moment as far as how that impacts the latest housing data. And the pace at which things are going up, I think, is concerning. We had gone through a very benign period this summer when this soft landing narrative, along with the fact that belief was really taking root that we had seen peak rates was really gaining momentum. And now I think a lot of that has been shuttered to the side and there's a lot of doubts as to when we will indeed hit peak treasury rates. Yeah, there's a lot of activity this week, Manus, and none of it really was great for the investment community. You know, the only maybe saving grace here is that the economy and the, you know, economic news came in a little cooler than expected. So maybe that takes some of the hawkish tone away from the Fed. Although, to your point, you know, when asked last week, Powell said the base case was not a soft landing. What we're seeing, you know, Haley gave, gave us a nice lead in to some of the economic news. And so we'll just run through a few of these things quickly. S&P, CoreLogic, Case-Shiller Index uh, rose nine-tenths of a percent in July as compared with the previous month. That was up for the sixth month in a row. On a year-over-year -year basis, home prices across the top 20 metros were up a tenth of a percent nationally. And so even though we're seeing significantly higher interest rates, we're seeing transaction volume slow. We're still seeing increases across the uh, pricing spectrum on residential. And if we look at uh, new home sales, they fell 8.7% in August. Uh, mostly due to high mortgage rates. That was according to the Commerce Department. And then consumer confidence stumbled to a four-month low. And so I think that's fairly indicative that maybe the soft landing narrative is starting to fade away in the minds of consumers, and they're starting to realize that we're, we're probably going to see a, a harder landing than what was anticipated. So you know, the index dropped 5.7 points from 108.7 in August. That was a revision. And then again, uh, down to 103 here uh, for this month. So really interesting uh, narrative there. You know, if you wanted to see some potential good news, I guess, the number of unemployment benefit applicants uh, rose slightly, but uh, was really fairly anemic. There was no significant size of rising unemployment, not a lot of job losses on the broader economic spectrum at this point. So economists had estimated 214,000 last week, and they came in at about 204000 on the layoff front. So potentially still a strong you know, labor market. And then lastly, on the mortgage side for single family residential, we talked about 
sales prices being up, even though transaction volume is down, that being due to higher interest rates. The average 30-year fixed rate mortgage at this point for non-jumbo loans, so this is anything $726,200 or less, increased to 7.41%, which was up 10 basis points from 7.31 the previous week. And if you look at actual volume, refinance applications fell 1% for the week and were 21% lower than they were a year ago. And applications for mortgage purchase was down 2% for the week or 27% below the same time a year ago. So a lot of, I would say, just tepid you know, market response to some of the, the news that you and Haley covered, Manis. And I think people are maybe starting to realize that if rates go to 7%, um, or if rates stay where they're at through 24, um, there's probably going to be some significant pain felt downstream across the uh, the CRE and residential markets. Yeah, it's just so hard to fathom when you think about this right now that it's a little surprising for Diamond to come out and even throw that 7% number out there. You know, it's it's almost irresponsible. You know, I know people have a great deal of respect for him one of the most senior corporate leaders in America. He's been around a long time and has had a great track record. But if we see a 7% Fed funds rate, which would be uh, another 150 to 175 basis points up from here, you are talking about crushing the floating rate market, interest rate caps, destroying whatever debt is out there for CRE, CLO borrowers. You're talking about another somewhere between 5 and 20% reduction in commercial real estate values and you're probably talking at that point a five and a half to six and a half percent ten year treasury rate. Now, if if that ultimately becomes peak interest rates, if we are talking seven, seven and a quarter, uh, which is what he was suggesting, I, I can't even imagine the amount of pain that banks will feel in their non performing assets where notes will be selling, the slowdown in commercial real estate activity, the inability to get capital, the entire commercial real estate market would grind to a halt, in my opinion. And certainly, you know, we hope in this particular case, Jamie Dimon is way off base. Yeah, it's interesting to hear his take. I mean, it wasn't, but maybe nine or 10 months ago that he was talking about an economic hurricane, I think is what he had said. And now he comes out with, with this. And I think it maybe is more just posturing to kind of send a message to everyone that's listening of, you know, let's not get there because uh, the ramifications would be fairly unprecedented, right? And so uh, the hawkish tone is what it is, but I think uh, we need to let the rates and the impact of the rates play out before things get too aggressive because I'm with you. You know, we've done a lot of research and put out a lot of information around banks and concentration ratios and all of the different things. And you know, you could make a case that while we haven't seen any more bank failures after the few that, that collapsed this year, we're still treading, you know, on, on some thin ice with a lot of those institutions. And if if things get higher, deals get tighter, liquidity dries up, it could be bad news across the entire system. Yeah, we were talking earlier today, several of us, we were on with some people in Washington and, you know, a couple of things jumped out at us, not jumped out, we pointed these things out. You know, one is that economic activity transactions in the real estate space is down 60%. So if you go up another 150 basis points, what are you then down 85%? As it is right now, the brokers are, are really not making profits. There's no sales taking place. And issuance, whether it's CMBS, CRE, CLOs, or anything else, down 50 or 60%, right? There are four arteries that pump blood through the commercial real estate markets, and three of them are partially closed right now, CMBS, banking, and the non-bank sector, right? Leaving only insurance companies as the non-clogged artery, right? A 7% rate would clog those arteries to a significantly higher degree. Today, we also released our delinquency numbers for September, and we actually saw the rate move higher again after a reprieve last month. Yeah, I think that the two narratives are consistent and have been consistent throughout the year. For the most part, the headline number continues to march higher. We've seen two months where the rate has dipped, but seven months where the rate has gone up. We're now about 160 basis points higher than where we were a year ago. The latest rate is about 4.4%, up from 2.9% last September. So that's a source of concern. And I think 
Lonnie, in a few minutes, will talk about how that parallels on the banking side. But in the office segment, the overall rate is concerning. The office rate is alarming. What we're seeing there was another 50 basis point jump. The delinquency rate in offices, 5.6% now. That's up from 1.5% a year ago. So we're talking about almost a 4x increase in the delinquency rate in offices. And, th and there just seems to be no sign of slowing. As we've been putting out trading alerts and news in our 6.30 a.m. Trump wire, every single month, there's another nine-figure CMBS loan for which the borrower is, is giving back the keys. And we'll talk more about these shortly. But there's no respite for the office space right now. There's very little capital available. When you look at these CMBS deals, you may find an office or two being securitized, but it's often with a 15-year lease in place for a healthcare firm or a big corporate entity where the risk is really de minimis for the property itself. And, and so that's the issue right now, that the rate is likely continuing to go higher for the next six to 12 months, and offices will drag things to a level we haven't seen in a while. Offices are probably near a multi, multi-year high. I haven't looked at the data recently, but I would expect that this is probably the highest offices have been in, in, in 10 years. That's alarming. I will close it out with a, with a bit of a green shoot, and that is almost all other property types this month were unchanged. Every other property type saw only modest improvement or modest increases in the delinquency rate. So everything else is, is kind of okay, but the offices remain a big concern for everybody. Yeah, I think it's interesting, man. This office obviously is the one that we should talk about. I wanted to mention quickly, though, multifamily, if you look at where it was 12 months ago compared to now, it's up 2x. So it's not to the same level of office, and it's still on a historical basis. It's less than 2%, but it was less than 1% at 12 months ago. And we've seen that tip, tick up fairly significantly. I think I have, on a lighter note, the remedy for the office uh, challenges. Over the last week and a half, we've seen what's happened to Travis Kelsey's career, his uh, follower count, his jersey sales, and everything else. We saw what happened today when they announced that Taylor Swift is going to be attending the Jets game this weekend. So I'm thinking if you own an office building, you got to be reaching out to Taylor Swift's management seeing if you can't set up some sort of monthly meet and greet at the office. Because if you do that, I think office performance is going to go up significantly. Yeah, it wouldn't be bad to see uh, Taylor walking around with Barry Sternlich or some other real estate guru uh, instead of a football player. Maybe that would be just the shot in the arm that the industry needs. We'll see. Maybe we can get something set up. We'd love to have Taylor on the podcast, too. That would be pretty great if we could make that happen. I'll send her a shirt. Maybe she'll just <laughs> wear it. <laughs> yeah, you know, so instead of her having the Eras uh, concerts, she could have, you know, like the Saving Office concert series or something like that. So uh, on, a, on a more serious note, our latest Q2 taller performance data, not surprisingly, Office in that data set, which for those that are maybe new listeners, taller stands for TREPS Anonymized Loan Level Repository, and that's a repository of bank balance sheet loan data which consists of about $160 billion worth of outstanding loan balance sourced from a number of banks across the U.S. And what we saw this uh, latest quarter was that the office delinquency rate in that data set increased from 2.7% to 4.9%. So that had hovered uh, for the last several years at sub-3%. In fact, up until recently, it was in the 1% range. And this last quarter, that data jumped up to 4.9%. So it's a pretty significant jump. And we've talked at length here on the pod about how the CMBS delinquency is usually a little bit higher than the bank balance sheet because the lenders on the bank side have a little more flexibility and maybe not some of those covenants that are in place on CMBS. So to see that number go from 2.7 to 4.9, I think is probably a louder siren or a brighter light or whatever you want to call it for that sector of the marketplace. Uh, we also saw, you know, a pretty significant decrease, and you mentioned this uh, earlier, Manus, uh, origination volume, uh, according to the taller data set, was only about 60% of the pre-COVID average, looking at, at volume heading into 2019. So, you know, some hard data now that, that helps support some of the stuff we've been talking about in terms of tighter credit conditions, less liquidity, less loans being made, and now we're actually starting to see the delinquency in the office sector and that subset of data start to pull uh, in a higher rate as well. 
So speaking of the office rates, we have a lot of office stories this week. Let's jump into them. Yes, we do have a lot of office stories that in the name of the game, I guess, for most of 2023, that we probably have as many office stories as we do uh, all other property types combined. And I guess that's what happens when one particular market segment is so underperforming the rest. So we have some green shoots and we have some crabgrass. We did have one piece of crabgrass in London. This is where Meta, Facebook, announced this week that they would pay $180 million to terminate a lease in that city. And we don't talk about Europe very much in terms of the activity there, but that is of a piece. We've seen several large firms there, including many banks, downsize in London in that shard area, if that's the one I'm thinking of, the uh, the new... London office area or new to the last decade or so, people downsizing considerably. And $180 million is nothing to sneeze at. That must have been a lease that had a long way to go. The property in question there is one Triton Square. So we'll try to give you more European news in the future as we see it. Uh, a couple of rough office comps. Uh, I'll run through these and then Lonnie can remark. The first one comes from the Orange County Business Journal. One Pacific Plaza in Huntington Beach has been sold for a two-thirds discount to its 2018 value. The property is a 400,000 square foot office that was sold for $42 million. That equates to about 107 bucks a square foot. In 2018, the property sold for 124 million, which was $315 million a square foot. The article itself calls the sale lender facilitated, which usually means that there's some kind of discounted payoff or something like that, that the bank is involved and some kind of stipulated foreclosure takes place or non-judicial foreclosure. The office had been encumbered with $90 million of debt before the sale. So we're talking about nearly a $50 million loss, which was outside of CMBS. The interesting thing about this story was that in 2007, uh, a CMBS loan of more than $100 million was originated. The collateral was valued at $140 million in 2007. Uh, it would be reduced several times, and the loan was later modified and eventually paid off with debt forgiveness. So this particular property seems star-crossed. Several losses over the last 15 years with the value plunging once, reviving in 2018, and plunging again. So a really rough office comp for Huntington Beach. The next one comes from Chicago, Danny Ecker of Crane's Chicago Business. Danny, a great reporter for that region and somebody we refer to all the time. Portland, Oregon-based Manash Properties, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, acquired 230 West Monroe Street for $45 million. This is a 625,000 square foot asset. The sale compares to a $122 million sale price in 2014. Assesso Partners was the seller. Menashe, by the way, was also the buyer of a property recently in downtown Portland. So maybe Menashe knows something we don't know, or maybe they're positioning themselves to make a killing in the future, buying these properties at $100 a square foot, their trough, and waiting for that rebound to come in. Let's hope so. It's a great sign of confidence in markets in Portland and Chicago that uh, don't have a lot of confidence right now. Yeah, the interesting takeaway for me on these stories, Manus, is these prices are significantly less than what they were purchased for before the big run-up in, say, 2019, 2020, and 2021. So we've talked about a couple of properties over the last several months where somebody paid outrageous money in 2021 or 2020. They were highly leveraged. They had to get out of the deal. These properties, the Orange County property, it looks like it had sold in 2018 at 124.5. So that was pre-COVID. That was when we would consider the market to be operating in a normal state. Um, and the one here in Chicago, 45 million today's dollars, they paid 122 back in 2014. So there was no run-up in price there. So when you're getting a discount to those, you know, what I would consider normalized values to these magnitude, you're hoping that there's some upside for these, these buyers. I think on the Orange County sale, $107 a square foot, that seems really cheap, especially when the previous price was $315 and the stuff in Chicago, uh, similar. So I would say I'm optimistic for these buyers. Um, these are the type of courageous deals that you make when everyone else is afraid to pull the trigger. And hopefully in three to five years, these guys are sitting really pretty with the really low basis and some assets that have been, you know, repositioned with occupancy and 
and revenues that uh, substantiate, you know, some good upside for them. One of these days, we'll have to bring on old friend Shlomo Chop, who's never been on the pod before. We'd like to have him on, but we have met him at conferences and so forth, and we've referred to him before. He had been very bearish on commercial real estate and offices in particular. I'd love to get his take on whether he thinks that prices at these levels represents a trough or if there's another leg down for these, a guy whose uh, opinion I respect and one of these days we'll, we'll get him on. Although I know Haley has a, a long list of guests tied up between now and, and probably the holidays. So we'd love to squeeze him in one of these days. Turning to a, another part, we've talked about the comps. Here are a couple of, let's call them jingle mail stories, not happy ones. This first one comes from The Real Deal. The owners of 300 East 42nd Street in Manhattan, so this is a couple blocks east of Grand Central Terminal, have handed the keys back to that property. The asset itself is a 240,000 square foot office. The office backs almost 120 million in floating rate debt that was originated in I believe 2022, the loan itself makes up over 10% of the collateral behind a 2022 CRE CLO deal. The property was sold in 2019 for 122 million. The office was valued at 142 million. It had an appraised value of 142 million uh, in 2021. The expectation was with the value add strategy that the valuation would grow to 210 million in 2025. The Real Deal article notes that the property will most likely be sold for less than its most recent value. It's unclear if they're referring to the 2019 sales price or the recent $142 million value. But uh, in any event, probably a loss coming there. Uh, the owners of that property were Somerset Partners and Meadow Partners. Um, and in the Philadelphia area, uh, a change of heart for the Philadelphia area landlord uh, we've been covering this story for a long time. It's an $85 million loan. The collateral had been the headquarters for GSK North America. That big pharma firm had reduced its office space moving out of that property a while ago. The borrower at one time wanted to do a maturity extension and was looking for a modification. This month, special servicer comments indicated that the borrower no longer is interested in extension and has offered to work with a lender on a stipulated foreclosure. So not a good story there. The property was valued at $132 million in 2018. This month, the value was lowered to under $90 million, still higher than the loan balance, but uh, certainly not moving in the proper direction. Yeah, it's really interesting when you look at a lot of these appraised values, man. So you see how quickly the market shifts in those values. I mean, that's why when you're an appraiser, you know, that opinion of value is as of that specific date that you're doing the report because the value fluctuations on these are significant. And so in the first story you talked about, you know, it's really great to have an as-is value and an as-stabilized value three years out. Um, but the reality is the market moves fast and sometimes you don't realize that upside and the reposition. And in this story here in Philadelphia, going from 132 million in 18 to 89 million, and the reality is, while that's above the loan balance now, it doesn't appear that that might be the case for long, you know, if this property doesn't stabilize. So it'll be very interesting to see how this plays out. We should probably do an analysis on on what the impact has been just from the appraisal perspective and in, in the data in our system, uh, because we've seen a growing number of these new appraisals coming in as significantly lower than the ad origination appraisals, which you would suspect given market conditions. But a lot of these are... are significant and we should uh, we should probably look at trying to quantify that as a percentage basis for the listeners. We've often compared the office trajectory which is in the early stages of its distress to what happened with malls which are now very late in their cycle of distress. The cycle of distress for malls started in 2017. Uh, many of those malls that have been distressed remain outstanding. They stayed outstanding for a long time. Uh, what we have seen in that segment to your point Lonnie, uh, as we talk about appraisals, is not only was the property appraised lower, it was appraised lower several times. So it's, it wasn't unusual to see a mall see its value drop 
in 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. Uh, and yet the, the owner continued to fight for these properties, sometimes uh, when there was huge amounts of negative equity in these assets. Uh, as I said, we're very early in this office evolution, what's happening right now. We don't know what will happen here, but it would not be an enormous surprise to see the same type of trajectory where you see reductions in valuation in, in 2023. And the next year, again, there's another valuation dip and another after that. And, and sometimes that's logical, right? Sometimes those dips on the retail side were because people were anticipating tenants renewing at lower per square foot renewals. And what turned out to be reality is the firm either went bankrupt, the tenant did, or renewed at a much lower basis. Uh, we don't have that data yet in the office space, but if that becomes the trajectory, you know, these assumptions that the appraisers are making, you throw them out the window at that point and, and everything starts anew. So uh, time will tell. Moving on to our next category, this is firms downgrading. And I apologize. I think there'll be happier moments in this podcast at some point. Right now, we're, we're going through a lot of negatives, but um, there are some positives and we'll have some happy moments uh, before this is all over. Uh, a couple of downsizings. The first one from Ashley Gerbal Kreitzer, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, of the Tampa Bay Business Journal. Johnson & Johnson has cut its Tampa office space by 60%. The company has subleased 30,000 square feet um, in the corporate center four, which is nearby its current office. It's leaving behind 90,000 square feet at the Hidden River Corporate Park in Tampa. In Dallas, Bank of America, this is kind of a mixed green, has signed on for 240,000 square feet of space that's under development. It's called the Parkside Project in Dallas. That's the good news. Uh, the bad news is the bank will be downsizing its footprint from 500,000 square feet at the Bank of America Plaza at 901 Main. That particular story comes from Radu Corpus of the Commercial Property Executive in Washington, D.C. This story comes from BizNow's John Bannister. CareFirst Blue Cross Blue Shield has signed a 62,000 square foot lease at 840 1st Avenue Northeast. Uh, that's a downsizing from about 140,000 square feet at that same property. The news comes from a market report from CBRE and JLL. And lastly, in this segment, uh, Roku, who we've mentioned many times, uh, twice this year they have announced that they were taking big charges for reducing their uh, commercial real estate footprint and for layoffs. Uh, they are adding to their San Jose sublease space the Real Deal reported that Roku has put 200,000 square feet of space out at 1155 Coleman Avenue uh, at the Coleman High Line in San Jose. Uh, this particular property does back CMBS. It backs a $167 million CMBS loan. There are two properties behind this particular loan, 1143 and 1155 Coleman 1143 is leased to Roku. Roku never took possession, and that space was offered for sublease in the spring. Now they're adding another 200,000 square feet at 1155. So the entire 360,000 square foot complex is available for sublease. Not a good sign for that San Jose market, and, and not a great sign, you know, for the whole Bay Area office market, which has really been hit hard from. Mountain View to Oakland to San Francisco to San Jose. Yeah, Roku is interesting because I think you, you mentioned in this story that they never took possession of that property. And I think we had a story about them maybe in Denver a couple of months ago where they didn't take possession of some office space there. So, you know, it just makes you wonder when they're signing those long-term leases and they're committing to a large fixed expense, what due diligence actually goes into that process. And so it's tough for them they're definitely making some decisions now that's going to uh, negatively impact their operations. I want to say, wasn't Roku one of the Silicon Valley bank depositors that had something crazy in the hundred of million, millions of dollars of unsecured deposits in the bank too? I think so. I think they were one of the big ones out there. I, I, I don't know that for sure, but that does certainly ring a bell. Yeah, so hopefully for them, they can get the real estate stuff at least figured out. And, um, you know, the other stories that you covered, Manus, I think it's just, you know, I would sum it up as saying another week, more sublease space, another week, more downsizing. 
seems to be the narrative that we talk about every week. And, uh, you know, again, transactions are happening, but if you're a broker or if you're an owner of a building, these are not the types of transactions that you necessarily want to be working on. I, I tread into this little, this area very lightly because I, I don't want to make light of the fact that Roku, you know, it, it's a struggle. They're laying off people. And whenever people are laid off, I, my heart goes out to those people and the company is struggling. But I do have to say that gaining possession of my own Roku has long been a struggle. That first I have to wrestle it from my kids. If my kids aren't around, it's under the couch somewhere, uh, unretrievable by me. And if it's not there, it's in my dog's teeth. Taking possession of the Roku has been uh, a challenge ever since we've gotten a Roku. So uh, just a little slice of life there in the uh, in the Clancy world. You might need to put a little Velcro on the back of that bad boy, man, and uh, Velcro it to the coffee table. Got to do something, man. That is uh, finding the dog teeth in the Roku. That's, <laughs> and the battery is gone, right? Not only do you, you can't operate the Roku, you know you're going to have a sick dog. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about some positives now. There were a few office green shoots. Before I get into these stories, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll combine a green shoot with a shout out. People know I was going to Las Vegas last week. I wasn't on the pod last week. Uh, thank you to Stephen for pinch hitting for me twice in four weeks. I'm grateful for that. But in Las Vegas, I put it out there that uh, if any listeners wanted to uh, meet with me, I would love to catch a cup of coffee and and, and and hang out. I did meet with three commercial real estate brokers, Mark, Robert, and Andrew for uh, an extended period of time on Friday. They touch a lot of different parts of the market. There's a lot of debt brokerage there, uh, not just in the Las Vegas area, but nationwide across all property types. Uh, they also have an office specialist. They were uh, optimistic about office. They thought that the Las Vegas market was punching above its weight, that there was a lot of things going on there. The sales per square foot were near record highs in some cases. And it was nice to hear. First of all, they were nice people. It was nice to get out uh, and talk shop with with listeners and, and, and meet some friendly faces. But I have to say, it was also nice to hear some optimism in a market segment, uh, the office segment, that has been really hard hit. And it's of a piece, right, that Lonnie and I have been saying this for a long time, that no two markets will be the same, that you will see San Francisco really hit hard, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Seattle, uh, Minneapolis. But there will be happy stories out there in markets that don't have quality of life issues, where people don't have long commutes, and the commutes are not expensive. So I hope we hear more of those. And certainly next time I go to Las Vegas or next time I go anywhere else, I, I will put a similar cry out for people to come meet with me. I'm going to talk more about this a little bit later, which is, is more to this. On the green shoot side, uh, two big ones, and this might be the most difficult name I will ever have to pronounce, and I really apologize in advance if I, if I make this sound terrible. Emma Walakawa Wanamwa of the Off Plan Property Exchange reported that Monarch Alternative Capital and Tourmaline Capital Partners have entered into an agreement to buy 801 Brickell. That's an office building in Miami. The property is being sold by Nuveen. Uh, Nuveen acquired the property, if I'm not mistaken, in, in 2001 for about 80 million, give or take. So over the course of two decades, they've more than tripled their money. Uh, in the article, the sales price is said to be approximately $250 million, which would be a record-breaking sales price for South Florida, which uh, in a market like this is, is really good news. Uh, another green shoot, this comes from the Orange County Business Journal, uh, Boot Barn will relocate its headquarters to the Irvine Company Spectrum Terrace office. The apparel company is upsizing its square footage from about 80,000 square feet to 120,000 square feet. So in a market that um, has seen enormous amounts of downsizing, Boot Barn uh, increasing its square footage by about 40%. So some good news there. Yeah, so to echo Manis's cry for uh, meetings, or I don't know how you, how you said that, Manis, uh, putting out the, the the sounder. I'm going to be in several locations over the next couple of weeks, and would have, be happy to meet with folks as well. I'm going to be in Miami, Charleston, Kentucky, and San Francisco area over the next month. So if uh, if any of those cities 
I uh, have people that would like to meet up, happy to grab a cup of coffee, although I'll probably drink a low-carb monster or a sweet tea. But yeah, we'd be happy to meet up. I, it's really great to hear from folks that are in that local market. I think what you shared, man, is from you know the brokers that you met with and their perspective from being boots on the ground is really additive for what we can do here on the podcast. And it gives some perspective that you know the data on its face may not show for us. You know, And so I think it's been really interesting to see Las Vegas grow. I mean, they've added a hockey team, they added the, the football team now, and they're trying to add a baseball team. And their industrial sector has grown significantly, and it seems like their office sector is growing too. So really great story to hear from, from that market. And some of these other uh, stories that you covered speaks to the fact that Activity Boot Barn, you know, that's, a, that's another one where they're going to be taking over a full building. So we've talked a lot about campuses and maybe the demise of the campus, kind of like a mall property. Um, so it's really great to see that they're going to be maybe moving into a, a large campus type of location and a large increase to their current uh, current base. So great stories, uh, some good green shoots to finish out the office sector. So I'm going to go through one more shout out, which is uh, of a similar piece to my meeting with Mark, Robert, and Andrew out there. My other meeting, I was expecting to meet a woman. I was staying in Cosmopolitan, and we were supposed to meet one afternoon for a cup of coffee. And I get a text from her about five minutes before a meeting saying, could you come join me at Bellagio, which is right across the, the way uh, from Cosmopolitan? I've had something come up. I'm going to be uh, at this particular restaurant, and I can't get out of this particular situation. So I said, I'll be there in 10 minutes. And I walk, you know, the 10-minute the walk over to Bellagio. And I walk in, and this woman didn't know that her friends were flying into Las Vegas to take her for a big girls weekend for a, for a meaningful birthday for her. So I went from expecting to have a cup of coffee at three o'clock in the afternoon to a birthday party for a woman with five women and a big vat of fruited tequila. And it was a blast, I have to say. And apparently three of the women are podcast listeners. So it, it was just a blast. I got to say it was so much fun. And if I get uh, authorization, I'll send a picture out on on Twitter of our event because it was just so much fun. So a shout out there to uh, Emily and Julie and the rest of the troop from Detroit. Emily, for those that might remember, uh, organized for us our first live podcast in the Motor City back in April. And it was Emily that uh, I ended up meeting at Bellagio along with uh, the troop. And it was just a, a great time. Yeah, we had fun with Emily in Detroit. I can only imagine uh, having a good time in Vegas. So happy birthday, happy belated birthday to uh, to Emily as well, from Lottie as well. So let's talk about retail. We have a training alert in Chicago, and then we also saw news of Target closing more stores this week. So let's start with the good news. We'll keep the green shoots going here. There were media reports this week that a new $700 million loan on the Oak Brook Center which is west of Chicago in Oak Brook, Illinois, had been originated. It's expected to be a CMBS loan. And I think the deal is making its way through the, the process. The green shoot here is several fold. First of all, a mall getting $700 million of new debt is nothing to sneeze at. It might be the biggest retail loan we've seen in years. Uh, I can't remember a single asset uh, retail loan of 700 million in, in forever. Uh, so that's one green shoot. Green shoot number two is this loan is going to take out a $320 million CMBS loan that was originated in 2020. So our listeners can do the math. If there's $700 million in debt now versus $320 million in 2020, the value of this 2.2 million square foot super regional mall uh, must have gone up considerably uh, over the last two years. So a really good green shoot there, a 2020 CMBS loan will be paid off at par uh, in the near term. Uh, the not so happy story, this is a really you know terrible story, is the AP was reporting and, and many others have uh, followed up with their own stories that uh, Target will close nine stores, one in New York City, two in Seattle, three in San Francisco slash Oakland, and three in Portland. And I guess this is no surprise. We've seen Walgreens and uh, Nordstrom's and CVS and others closing stores for a long time, uh, not to mention the high-end retailers. This has been happening consistently. Uh, we saw the, the video in Philadelphia with the Apple store this week being targeted for, for criminal activity. 
and, and I don't want to dwell on that too much. We know what it is. But the point I wanted to make with all this is that it's never been harder to be in risk management, surveillance, and portfolio management, in my opinion, than it is today. Because portfolio management historically has meant, how is my property doing? What is the inventory in the market? How much can I get per square footage? Are my tenants credit worthy? And is my borrower credit worthy, right? That is what lending and running a book of loans has been historically. Now you have to look at these situations where, at least for me, when I when I went through these nine stores, I'm putting that on a map and I'm drawing a, a circle around that map and saying, what other CMBS loans are in there? What are the multifamily properties that, because of quality of life issues and theft, might be those that see occupancy go from 95% to 75%? Where are their offices? Where are their um, street level retail that may be impacted apart from the target? And it's one of those things that it's very easy right now for a portfolio manager, whether it's debt or equity, to be hit in the back of the head. And that's very, very sad. And it's not what you signed on for. Yeah. If, if you put your uh, put our professor hats on, man, as you know, we talk about from a theoretical perspective in class, this uh, concept of an externality having an impact on on your individual property and could potentially diminish the value or in some cases increase the value. And these are the type of external forces that to your point, property owners, asset managers, portfolio managers, et cetera, there's no curing this. You know, like you can't, as an owner of that asset, change what's taking place if there's no law enforcement or if there's no penalty for people, you know, taking goods from your location. And so it's it's a really sad thing to see. And we've heard about it for the last several quarters on the earnings calls that, you know, these large retailers are starting to see a huge uptick in in theft, so much so that they're quantifying it in the millions of dollars on their earnings calls. Now that it's starting to close stores, it'll be really interesting to see if those local municipalities and, and police forces and others try to step up enforcement and prevent this from becoming its own form of a doom loop. We've, we've heard of the the doom loop in office. I think to your point, this has a, a really good chance of, you know, negatively impacting not just the retailers, but the multifamily tenants that live there, the restaurants that are operating in those locations, et cetera, et cetera. Like those big anchor, big box stores drive a lot of foot traffic in those into those smaller shadow anchor centers and so forth. And so uh, if they start closing at scale, uh, it's going to be a problem. And I, I mentioned a, was in Chicago a couple of months ago and, you know, everything being locked up behind glass just really takes away the shopping experience. It makes it to where you don't even want to go into the store. And so we've, we've gone through the retail big box, dark store kind of apocalypse and survived it. And these, these tenants had been able to kind of persevere and position themselves. But this appears to be something that could become systemic in, in the locations where, where the crime's not being enforced. So let's turn to our shout outs for the week. We have a lot. Selma A gave us a shout out on LinkedIn for our episode with Ethan Penner. If you all haven't listened to that yet, we released it earlier this week. It was an excellent episode. We talked life lessons, the history of CMBS, which he founded, and journeys through past financial crises. So it was a really great episode and we got a lot of great feedback on that. So tune in if you haven't. But Selma said she absolutely loved that podcast and it's required listening for all CRE professionals. Dan L. said he really enjoys listening to Tripwire. Chad C. actually came by our New York offices this week. So when Lani and Manis were putting out their pitches to meet them all across the country, you can meet me in New York. We've been having a lot of listeners come by. And Chad C. is a loyal listener. He came to meet us in person. He got to meet a few members of our team, learn about the Trep products and we're excited to keep working with him in the future. Haley, okay. I'm going to jump in with a, another shout out. I'm going for the full hat trick this week. I've done the Las Vegas guys. I've done the Detroit segment. This one is very uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, I go back with Joel Friedman a way back. He's a CMBS guy, cancer survivor. His son is also a cancer survivor, was diagnosed with lung cancer at a very young age. And from the time he was... Uh, a very, very young man, really, from the time he was seven or eight, started a charity for the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He is running a charity event 
this year. I've been part of, of his circle of uh, friends and donors for a while. And uh, I love Joel and I love what they're trying to do here. I really wanted to give a shout out for this. If you're interested in donating, please reach out to me and I'll send you the link to this. But I love when people in our industry and their immediate circle go above and beyond uh, to do something good. In this case, a, a real uh, hat tip to Skyler for everything he does for the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Thanks, Menace. That's great. And here we have a special shout out for Isaac, who quizzes his team every week about what was said on the Trepwire podcast. So, Isaac, let's see if you catch this one. A few more. Uh, Tyler T., our own Tyler, who we mentioned sometimes, she is actually in an NYU Craft C class. And every Wednesday night, she sends me a Slack saying, we're talking about the Trepwire podcast again. So thank you to the class that has several listeners and even some of the other members of the class who said they're now going to tune in. So thanks for spreading the word about our podcast. And maybe you guys will talk about this on your next Wednesday class. Mike B. sent us a Wall Street Journal article about Atlanta's office market. We heard from several listeners who wanted to take part and join the event that Lonnie's going to be speaking on in person in New York City on October 10th. So thanks to Akiko M., Daniel L., Reagan L., and Jason S. Jerry W. said he's been listening to the podcast since we started. It's his only never miss podcast. Mark H. said he really, really enjoys and learns a great deal from the podcast, and he wants to meet us in New York City, so we'll book some time for that. Blake H. mentioned our episode with Strip Mall Guy, so that one is still getting some great traction. That was a retail-focused episode all about strip malls, so tune into that if you haven't already. Jeff W. shared our episode with Ethan Penner as part of his Thought Leadership Thursday posts on LinkedIn. Jason J. thanked us for the podcast. Paul F. saw our tweet about getting new podcast shirts in, and he wanted one. So a few of you guys requested those shirts, and we'll get those sent out in the next few weeks. James E. sent some commentary about rent control versus rent stabilization. Patrick P. also requested a t-shirt, and he put out a nice summary post on LinkedIn about our Market Pulse webinars. So thank you, Patrick, for tuning in. And we also had Chloe comment on that post as well. And then several other listeners reached out this week. Mark R., a friend of ours who we met in California, loved the Ethan Penner pod. Darkfire Capital on Twitter. He had his work cut out for him this week because he had three Trep podcasts to catch up with. So he said he listened on 1.75 speed and got through them all. But he said it was a great deal of learning and it was the best deal in CRE. Black Eagle Real Estate and Deborah M. always gives us the love. She loved our podcast. And Jake S., Deirdre Ben A, Peter H, Asit V, Mark H, Arthur F, Vin R, Jason S, and Andrew E also reached out. So a lot of you guys this week, thank you all for reaching out, sending us your comments, your feedback. As an aside, we are almost at a million listens. So stay tuned for when we hit that number. We're really excited. Is there some big prize coming out for the millionth listener? Do we send them to Hawaii or or <laughs> or, or do you just send them a t-shirt? What is the, uh, or do we even know? Is We're not going to know. Listener? Do we know? But I will, I'm going to have to set some alert. You know, it's probably going to be like 1 a.m. We're going to hit that number. Someone's listening late at night, but we'll, we'll post it once we hit it. There we go. And with that, we'll close. Join us next week as we look at what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question or a comment, send an email to podcast.trep.com and subscribe to the Trepwire podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right.